Hi guys, Mr. Martin here. Thank you very much for joining me. What we're going to be talking about today is the biological approach to psychology. How exciting. Now, just to clarify what we're not going to be looking at today is any specific application of this, uh, of this particular approach. So we're not going to be looking at memory. We're not going to be looking at sleep and dreams. I'm going to save those for another video. What I do hope to give you today, however, is a very basic fundamental introduction to the biological approach. What does biology have to tell us about the human mind? Hopefully by the end of this video you'll have a better understanding of the biological approach to psychology. So let's get started. The biological approach believes all human behaviour to be a consequence of genetics and physiology and nothing else. That's the key to this. This is the only real approach in psychology that examines your behaviours, your thoughts, your feelings, whatever else it might be, from a purely biological, you might even say physical, point of view. You might like to interpret it this way. All that is psychological is at first biological. All your behaviours, all your thoughts, all your feelings, ultimately have a biological cause. What we're looking at here is a diagram of the human brain. Now, we are missing a hemisphere, so this is only one half of a human brain. There are multiple different parts, as you can see. Some of these parts have very little to do with psychology. For example, the pons, the medulla, these parts of the brain stem, not a lot going on there in terms of psychology. The cerebellum, not a lot going on there in terms of psychology. What we're really interested in is this huge, big, fleshy, pinky, grey organ on top. I know it's yellow in this diagram, but the diagram is wrong. This is your cerebrum. That is you you're looking at. Your thoughts, your feelings, your memory, your personality. All of it is processed, stored, dealt with in here. Now, some of the areas of the cerebrum have more to do with certain behaviours than others. For example, vision, perception, that's all dealt with down here at the back of your brain, um, your uh, hippocampus and amygdala, your limbic system, which is kind of in the middle here, that's more to do with memory. So there are lots of different parts of this doing different things. However, a biologist would view the brain as one whole interconnected organ. And so we can't differentiate like that. We have to take the brain as one whole organ here. The biological approach has, roughly speaking, three relevant ways that it can be used to study psychology with. The first of those we call the comparative method. Now you can imagine going up to a psychology ethics board and saying, well, I've got this experiment in mind. I want to see what this specific part of the brain does. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tie down this human being, I'm going to drill into their brain, and I'm going to slice out this bit of their, of their head, and we're going to see what happens to their behaviour. It's not Victorian times, so that's not really done anymore. It used to be able to, but not so much anymore. So what can we do instead? Well, how about we look at different species of animal? How about we observe what they do in terms of their behaviour? Or how about we observe what their brains do? and see what they can tell us about their specific brains, and by extension, about our own. The lady you can see in the picture there is Jane Goodall. She is one of the world's most famous primatologists. She studies primates, obviously. Um, her main focus of interest was in chimpanzees. You can see in the picture the, the sheer imitation going on there is amazing. So what can we tell about chimpanzee brains based on their behaviour? And then by extension, what can we tell about our own brains, our own behaviour, given that chimpanzees are one of our closest animal relatives? Down below, you can see a comparison between a mouse brain and a human brain. That's not to size, uh, just to scale, uh, obviously, that mouse would be terrifying if it was that big. But you can see a lot of similarities between them. There's a lot of difference, obviously. The bit in the top, the two little kind of bunny ears, that's the mouse's um, a smell sensor, obviously their sense of smell, much more important than our own. But there are a lot of similarities between mice 
rat brains, uh, monkey brains, and human brains. So, for example, if we did want to start slicing and dicing, or silencing genes, or we did want to start uh, poking about, how about we use an animal instead, see what happens to its behaviour, and then infer what might happen to our own. That's comparative method. Physiology explains how the nervous system and our hormones work inside our body, how the brain functions and how changes in its structure or its function can affect our behaviour. So really what we're looking at here is the brain working at a molecular level. For example, we could examine antidepressants here. We could see how they work at a physiological level. If we didn't have this physiological understanding of antidepressants, we wouldn't really know how they worked, we wouldn't know how to prescribe them safely, and the logical conclusion, we wouldn't really understand much about mental illness at all, unless we look at the specific brain structures and chemicals that are involved. Finally, inheritance. This means what genes an animal inherits from its parents. Charles Darwin himself was very, very into the inheritance of behaviour. So, for example, we know that in certain dog breeds that behaviour is very much inherited. We know that certain dog breeds are very, very aggressive and certain dog breeds not so much. That is very much enshrined in their genetics. Well, does the same thing happen in humans, though? Are people aggressive because their parents were aggressive? Are children intelligent because their parents had genes for intelligence? Maybe, maybe not. In terms of strengths and weaknesses, one of the key factors when thinking about the biological approach is that it's very scientific. You've probably processed that by now. This approach is very much based in the laboratory. So we can control for variables. We can produce reliable research. We can get the same results time and time again. This is an excellent way of showing cause and effect relationships. If we change one thing, what effect does it have on behaviour, particularly with our animal models? This biological approach has a multitude of applications. Now, the main uh, application for this obviously is in mental illness and our understanding of abnormal psychology, but there are multiple other places we can go as well. For example, the study of intelligence, of IQ, we can locate specific genes which make a person smarter. What about looking at relationships, specifically in terms of parent and child or between uh, romantic partners? What's happening there at a chemical level inside their brain? What about looking at the stress response that people have in terms of specific chemicals? There's a huge variety of applications. One of the biggest strengths of the biological approach is it gives a logical counter-argument to the nurture side of this debate. Now, there are psychologists out there who would say, oh no, no, and their human behaviour is all to do with uh, you know, how you were raised and your parents and your environment and all those kind of things. And a biologist would come through and say, shut up, it's all to do with that person's brain and nothing else. We can look at it, we can observe it, we can measure it. That's how we should be understanding psychology. Finally, it has multiple supporting studies from many different disciplines, from the fields of zoology, evolutionary psychology, human biology, multiple different studies that tell us the biological approach should be the one to be listened to. One of the strengths of this approach is that it's very scientific. And one of the weaknesses of this approach is that it's very scientific. If we are basing all of our conclusions based on lab work, have we really concluded anything at all? For example, if we're looking at a specific mouse that we've raised in the laboratory and we have changed its brain by using very hot needles or very sharp scalpels and then we have deliberately stressed it out and seen what effect it has on its behaviour, well, so what? What does that tell us about human behaviour? What does that tell us about human psychology? The answer, uh, probably not very much. This is a very controversial area of... Um, of psychology. Second weakness is that this is deterministic. Determinism is frowned upon in psychology. Basically this means there is no room for you in this. There is no room for free 
will. So if you have a specific cocktail of chemicals inside your head, well, does that always mean that you're going to react the same way? Where is your personality in this? Where is the decision making in this? Where are you involved in this process? It's also reductionist. We are reducing these huge problems, things like love, friendship, aggression, things like sleep and dreams, down to a cocktail of chemicals. Well, does that tell us anything at all? And what it does tell us, is it relevant to our understanding of humans? Again, probably not. It doesn't recognise the cognitive processes either. For example, different people react different ways, even if their biology is the same. We all know people who are incredibly stressed out by, well, let's say exams, and we all know people that doesn't phase them at all. Well, why should that be? The stress chemicals are the same, the stress hormones are the same, so why does it have a different impact on them? That cannot be explained by the biological approach. We might even say that the biological approach is one vast oversimplification of the area of human psychology. We are oversimplifying the huge complexity of physical systems that exist and how they interact with the environment. We cannot explain away vast, incredibly complex human behaviour in terms of a few neurons, in terms of a few chemicals. It just simply can't be done. In summation, guys, the biological approach to psychology is a really good starting point to understanding human behaviour. It tells us a huge amount about how specific chemicals and specific brain structures work, but that's all it ever can be, a starting point. To really understand the huge complexity that exists within human beings, we have to take the biology into uh, understanding, of course, but we also have to scratch a little bit deeper and come at things from a slightly different point of view. Thanks a lot for joining me today, guys. That has been uh, hopefully a helpful, uh, very brief introduction into the biological approach. Our next video will be all about the cognitive approach to psychology, how it differs to this one, and what it's got to tell us about the human mind. Hope I'll see you there. But until then, hope you have a nice day, guys, and we'll see you later. Thanks very much.